This is Heart Rhythm TV and I'm Ambrose Panico. Pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Kirchhoff all the way here from Germany. Thank you and welcome for joining us in the studio. Okay. Uh, we're here today to discuss uh, secondary analysis of the NOAA AFNET 6 trial. Mm -hmm. And I think before we dive in, one of the things a lot of us were hoping with NOAA, with Artesia, was we were going to get this magic number, right? We we're going to come out of this and we we're going to know exactly what the magic number is to, to change our decision and go from there. And as most things in medicine, it's not quite that simple. Um, so secondary analysis of the NOAA AF6 uh, um, trial and looking at specifically in patients who have a history of stroke, um, is there, without a diagnosis of EKG-based atrial fibrillation, is there a significant you know, impact here? So why don't you take us through what you think is the most important uh, take-home points for our, our viewers? So I think, as you said, when we plan NOAA FNET 6, and I'm sure the Artesia team had the same, we actually thought this is almost like a sure win. Then we're gonna show that anticoagulation prevents strokes. And the most striking and consistent finding is that the anticoagulation without uh, the stroke rate without anticoagulation is actually much lower than expected. Half of what we planned, about one percent per year. Um, and then we start looking for subgroups in whom uh, anticoagulation may be justified because they have a higher stroke rate. And of course, prior stroke or TIA is one of the subgroups that comes to mind. Now I think it's worth recognizing that the loop study already suggested that the effect of loop recorder detected AF triggered anticoagulation is actually much lower than expected. Um, and that is the main finding that we have in NOAA FNET 6 in the subgroup of 253 patients with a prior stroke or prior TIA. The stroke rate is relatively low. It's estimated at 2.3% per year, but it could be as low as 0.5 and as high as 10. Um, and anticoagulation may reduce that, but we can't really document this statistically. But we also have a signal that uh, anticoagulation increases bleeding. And the number of major bleeds which was actually four times higher in the patients with a prior stroke than in those uh, who did not get anticoagulation with a prior stroke. So it's as you say, there is no black and white. We are still in the middle ground. And I want to say that um, yeah. all of these sub-analyses are underpowered for really giving you definitive answers. All they can give you are hints uh, so that you can have a better informed conversation with your patients. Yep. I think you probably just answered the question I was going to ask you next, is that what is our biggest limitation here? And, and I think that's probably one of them, right, for sure, is, is uh, um, the power. Uh, and again, I'm very interested that the, the overall stroke risk was quite low, you know, in, the, um, in both groups, uh, lower than expected. Um, so on that note, where, where do you think future directions, where do you think we need to go next? So I think, first thing, just to elaborate on that, uh, we actually did a back of an envelope calculation. If you wanted to test the observed event reduction that we saw in that subgroup analysis from 2.3% uh, stroke per year to 1.6% stroke per year, you would actually have to randomize between 5 and 15,000 patients with a prior stroke or TIA and device detected AF. So it would be a really big trial. Um, I think there is a group of patients with device detected atrial fibrillation that are at high risk of stroke and in whom we should use anticoagulation. It's probably a small group. And I think the first simple message from NOAA and Artesia is if you find device detected AF, you can actually relax. Uh, it's not something that needs immediate attention and doesn't have to be sorted tomorrow. You can, right. should probably take time to think. We need to work out better ways to predict who is at high risk of stroke. I think it's probably going to be a combination of arrhythmia burden, AF burden. I think one of the things that I have already learned from the last year is that arrhythmia burden probably matters more for stroke risk than we thought. But there are also better ways to estimate stroke risk than the Chatsvask score. And we have to work on those. A hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. Um, so on that note, thank you again for joining us in the studio. Really enjoyed sure. talking with you about this and look forward to what's to come next. That will. This is Ambrose Panico signing off for HRS TV. You can continue to follow us for more content on our YouTube channel, on Twitter and X, and LinkedIn.